Dear students, in the previous lecture we talked about how genetic evolution happens in the cell whether it is vertically, horizontally or via recombination. Today I am going to uh, revise two major ways of horizontal gene transfer just so that you are clear. We have sort of talked enough about transformation for you to understand the basic of transformation not the nitty gritty microbiological detail but enough that for you to understand how to apply it in environmental problems. And then after that we will go in and see how we make uh, taxonomic trees and how we annotate our, how, how we make sense out of our sequences and how we make sense of the epigenetic evolution, how it helps us in making trees and even addressing the primary question of biology, how did life start. So if we make trees, ideally we can trace back evolution to the first ancestor which we call as last universal common ancestor, Luca. So, uh, how we make those trees, how we make sense out of our uh, biological data, that is what we are going to cover today. Let us get started. Alrighty. So, uh, just to revise, last time I talked about transformation, conjugation and transduction. So, let us look at, um, uh, let us look at transformation and conjugation in detail. So, in transformation we have this DNA that is lying outside the cell. We have DNA binding protein on the cell membrane which binds, which picks which sticks the extracellular DNA to the microbial cell and then a nuclei uh, when um, one of the uh, protein will allow the extracellular DNA to enter in a form of single strand here inside the cell. So, one it is nucleated. So, one um, strand is destroyed outside and notice the REC A protein is present here. So, the REC A will cause recombination to happen here and next thing you know you have recombination that has occurred. It is a homologous recombination because the entire uh, extracellular DNA has been incorporated um, and this is your transformation, typical transformation that is used in um, uh, conventional cloning techniques and it is also very important in terms of antimicrobial resistance. Now, let us look at transduction. Usually when a bacteriophage at attaches to a, a cell, bac bacteriophage is virus that attacks a cell, it secretes its DNA or RNA into the cell, forces this, it hijacks the cell, forces it to make multiple copies of its own proteins and then we have multiple virus left, they lyse the cell and they come out. Now at times what happens is that some bacteriophage when they attack a cell, not only do they force the cell to make uh, its proteins and its structure, its RNA or DNA, but at times they also pick up the DNA of the cell, fragments of DNA of the cell. So, these phages that have that are made after this cell was lysed and hi after hijacking and lysing this particular cell and now have the fragments of its DNA. Now, at times when they attack another cell which is a recipient, they can inject these fragments of DNA which can undergo homologous recombination into the chromosome and then become the part of the bacterial chromosome. Thus, this is transduced bacterium. So, transduction is also very common in archaea and bacteria both and it is very, very important when we are studying horizontal gene transfer. Now, let us move on and let us try to see how we make sense of all this information, how we can use this these techniques and our understanding to take our environmental sample and understand what is going on. So, let us say you take, a, take your sample, it is either water sample, soil sample, fecal matter or some other thing. If you are an environmental engineer like I am, you are typically working with either water, fecal matter like or activated sludge or other um, biomass that is that is a byproduct of fecal matter or waste or you are working with soil. So, what we do we first step is we extract DNA. First step is to extract, extract nucleic acid. In this particular diagram we are extracting only DNA, but you might also want to extract RNA. So, all nucleic acids depending on what your interest is. And then what we do is we use PCR. So, we do uh, polymerase chain reaction. Usually we uh, the one that we are most interested in is 16S rRNA poly, uh, gene amplification. So, this is a ribosomal gene. 16S rRNA, 16S small subunit rRNA and we, the, the, I have mentioned in previous lectures about why we use 16S rRNA. So, if you are confused, go ahead and take a look at those lectures. And PCR is basically a chemical reaction through which we amplify the gene of interest which is 16S rRNA here. Now, once this gene has been uh, amplified, we pull all the samples. So, how we pull it, we, now this is very, very important because this diagram is not only telling you how we make sense out of data, but it is actually giving you an example of the um, second and third generation sequencing techniques. So, I think it is a good idea for me to go ahead and explain to you more in detail. So, 
um, earlier what we would do once we have amplified 16 is rRNA ideally it is from one bacteria not from a pool environmental pool like it is here. So, in between extraction of DNA and PCR here there is another step of cloning. So, we extract DNA, we amplify the PCR, we clone it and then we do sequencing on it. Okay? But here we are doing different work. What we are doing here is now in this 16S rRNA, we have the 16S rRNA gene from different microbes. We might have it from proteobacteria, we might have it from firmicutes, we might have it from very, very different microbes. We might uh, even have um, um, some 16S rRNA. Well, in basically 16S RNA from different microbes that are present in our sample. Now, what we do when we um, usually we have 100 of samples, let us say I have 100 samples, I can add a barcode to each of the samples. So, barcode is a very short nucleotide chain, so it is an oligonucleotide and uh, its sequence acts like an identifier. So, whenever I get a sequence that matches to my barcode, I know which, which sample it came from. So, if I have 100 samples, sample 1, sample 2, sample 3, sample 4, I will have 100 barcodes and each of one barcode will go to one sample and it will attach itself to the amplicon, to the gene that I have amplified which in this case is 16S rRNA. So, I amplify it by including barcode. Now, I pull all the samples. I can now take the 16S RRNA amplicon from all samples, put them in one tube. The reason I can do is because amplicon from each sample has a barcode. So, once I sequence, I know which sample it came from. And then this is 454 NGS, which is basically 454 pyro sequencing. I have talked about it in one of the previous lectures. So, go ahead and take a look what 454 next generation sequencing is. So, the, after doing pyro sequencing, I create first, first few files. The first few files, I pull all the data, I do bioinformatics on it. So, I find out the quality score, I find out FASTA, I check for Chimera, which are uh, artificial sequences that are not really there. And I look, I do different kinds of analyses. And now, what I can do is I can annotate, I can align the sequences that I have, which are good quality sequences. And by the way, in bioinformatic portion, we in bioinformatic portion, we also get rid of the barcodes. So, we get rid of the barcodes and we instead of writing barcode A, T, G, C, whatever the barcode is, we write sample 1, so these are the sequences. Sample 2, these are the thousands of sequences or millions of sequences. Now, all these sequences can be aligned to the database that we have, well established, well curated databases. And then for each sequence, we can get some taxonomic information. This sequence matches proteobacteria. Beta proteobacteria within proteobacteria, okay, this probably is beta proteobacteria. Sometimes I might get even more information. So, not only do I know it is Fermicute, but I also know it is Clostridium within Fermicute. So, I might also know it is similar to Clostridium thermosilum. So, now I know oh, all right, eh, Clostridium thermosilum may be cell dose degradation. So, this kind of information I get from after aligning and annotating my sequences. Now, using the taxonomic composition, I can do two kind of analyses. I can uh, do alpha diversity analysis, I can see how diverse a sample is within itself. Let us say I take water sample, I get 100 sequences from water sample. So, maybe in 100 sequences, I have let us say 30 unique sequences. So, basically there are 30 species that are present and there are 100 that I have sequenced in water and I get 100 sequences from fecal matter, but instead of 30 unique sequences, I have 85 unique sequences. So, I can say okay, the alpha diversity of uh, water in fecal matter suggests that fecal matter is more diverse than so uh, water. So, this is alpha diversity. I can also look at beta diversity when I want to know okay, fecal matter of termite versus fecal matter of human being and I want to know which is more diverse. So, I want to look at beta diversity. I want to look at water in the influent of wastewater treatment plant and water in the effluent and then look at the diversity, right. So, these kind of um, intra sample analyses are known as beta diversity analyses. And uh, what I can do is not, um, so for example, I am comparing the beta, I am doing beta diversity analyses between the influent of wastewater treatment plant and effluent of wastewater treatment plant. When I compare them, I can look at metadata, okay, what was the BOD in the influent? Huh? What was the total heterotrophic uh, plate count? What was the total 16S RRNA number that I got for my quantitative polymerase chain reaction, QPCR? Versus what were these attributes for um, my effluent? What were the heavy metals in influent? What were the heavy metals in effluent? So, I can compare all this and say alrighty, when I compare the biome, I can see how biomass impacts the diversity. So, when biomass reduces 100 times how um, from between influent and effluent, what is the reduction in diversity? So, I can do these kind of analyses, meaningful analyses using the metadata. I can also make phylogenetic trees. So, what are these phylogenetic trees? We will get the, well, we ne next of the lecture, rest of the lecture is dedicated to that. 
So, a phylogenetic tree will look like this to you. Here, usually, um, the these um, these nodes they are linked to your ancestor. So here it must be an ancestor, and from this ancestor there were two speciation between taxonomic group C and some other taxonomic group, which is co common ancestor of taxon A and taxon B. And here there was another speciation A and B. So A and B are sister groups. They came from same common ancestor. C is the outgroup of A and B. Outgroup means it is not belonging to the uh, sibling family of A and B. So th this is how you understand. Now uh, often what happens is um, the longer these lines are, so there are two ways of writing uh, making these dendrograms. These are called dendrograms. One of the ways is that the further uh, the two species are from each other, the longer the lines would be. For example, the distance between A and B is summation of this length and this length distance between species A and B is equal to AA plus BB. Okay, so branch length and this is the node. Alrighty. Now let us look at these two pictures from your textbook. This particular dendrogram does not have any common ancestor. We do not know if this is a common ancestor, if this is the common ancestor, if this is common ancestor. So this kind of tree is called unrooted tree. Basically here I have five different sequences and I looked at the similarity and I made the trees. Oh yeah, by the way, I, I also want to tell you how to make these trees, but let us start from here now. Now in these cases, they give you direction and they tell you, well, this is the common ancestor from which two uh, sister branches came and then speciation happened further. Four, five are sisters, one, two, three are outgrouped to it, two, three are sisters, one, four, five are outgrouped to it. This can also be represented in this way. So these are the nodes, these are the branches, these are the lineages. Okay, now let's see how we make these um, trees. So from your FASTQ file, you will FASTA file, you will get species A, species B. So you can get detailed information as um, gamma protobacteria, what gamma protobacteria, delta protobacteria, what kind of delta protobacteria. You can just get OTU1, OTU2, OTU2, OTU3, or species A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. And here you have sequence, usually they are very long, but in this case, for representative purposes, this is enough. So the first step is alignment. We align these um, sequences to each other. So look here, A is aligned. It so happens that all of the species have A in this place. In the next place, all of them have C. Third, all but two have G. So we have highlighted it in bold. Species C and D have a base pair difference here. In the fourth, all of them have A, fifth, G, and so on and so forth. In this one, there, there are two differences here. So all the differences are highlighted in bold. Now, once we have highlighted the differences, we can make a matrix of similarity. So matrix of similarity, so uh, we can find out the Euclidean distance between the samples or we can find the break or this distance. There are many statistical parameters. Basically, they will tell you how similar or how dissimilar each species is to each other. And usually they are represented in matrix form. So you will have species A, B, C, D written here, species A, B, C, D written here, and you will have similarity numbers written here. Now, once you have your similarity or dissimilarity ma matrix, by the way, I say similarity or dissimilarity, um, dissimilarity matrix because similarity in this case is equal to 1 minus dissimilarity. Uh, dissimilarity. Okay. So once you have your uh, similarity matrix or dissimilarity matrix, you can do clustering and this is hierarchical clustering by the way. And um, I use for my analyses, I use uh, software R, it is open source free of cost software. And um, I find it very user friendly, but it does have a steep learning curve. I encourage you to learn and there is actually an NPTEL course on R, so I encourage you to go and find out about it. So in R, there is a very nice package called Vegan. So within the R, which is an open source software, a statistical software, which I use a lot, there is a package called vegan. And this vegan package allows you to calculate different kinds of distances. For example, you can calculate Bray-Curtis distance, you can calculate Euclidean distance. And all of these will help you make matrices, which will look like this. So you have your
So these are your species 1, 2, 3, species 2, 3, 4 and then you can have similarity how similar they are. Maybe species 1 and 2 are 25 percent similar, 1 and 3 are 26 percent similar, 1 and 4 are 84 percent similar and then you can have obviously 2 and 2 are 100 percent similar and 3 and 3 are 100. So the diagonal usually runs 100. So this way you this similarity matrix you can use a vegan package and um, there is another package that I use it is called PV Clust. So this the package helps me make hierarchical uh, dendrograms or I do hierarchical clustering and the beauty is that it uses the similarity to group the similar species together and when it does that it also tells me if the grouping is significantly st statistically significant or not. So, so in summary the way to make these uh, dendrograms is by aligning the sequences calculating their similarity, species similarity and then clustering the similar ones together. Alrighty, the other way in which the genetic evolution happens which we did not cover in the previous lecture apart from vertical uh, mutations and uh, transfer of genes, horizontal, uh, um, horizontal gene transfer and recombination is genetic drift. So genetic drift is a natural drift in the genetic sig signature of a population or of a community um, because of different reasons one of them is bottleneck. So for example here in the original population we have obviously four different colors of balls or four different colors of genes and all of them are equally distributed. So the frequency is 10, 10, 10 out of 40 balls and then over time for some chance after some a chance event you know there was no uh, induced mutation nothing the yellow balls just disappeared some of the greens disappeared some of the purples and blue disappeared and the frequency varied so the distribution varied and then when again repopulation happened I got a very different community so the gene genetic pool has drifted so the drift suggests that it is not induced intentionally it is not a drastic change but it happens over time and um, it is almost natural we cannot stop it. Okay. So now after talking about genetic drift now what I want to understand is like if I have these microbes blue, yellow, purple, green how do I tell which of them are similar which of them are not similar so that I can create hierarchical clusters like this. So for that the most thorough technique is DNA DNA hybridization. Now how does DNA DNA hybridization work? Okay, Let us take a look. So let us say I am I know what organism one is, I have grown it in the lab, I have cultured it, I have fully sequenced it and now I have isolated organism two and I suspect that it is similar to organism one or it may be organism one. So in order to understand whether it is organism one or how different or how similar it is to organism one, what I do is I extract DNA from both genomic DNA from organism one and organism two. I in for organism 1 I will shear the DNA so I have made small fragments of the DNA and I have labeled it with a tag and in this I have just sheared the DNA using similar process. Now here I am heating now with heat the DNA will denature so the double stranded fragments will become single stranded fragment. Now the next step is what I will do is I will mix the DNA from two organism and I will make sure that the unlabeled one is in excess so I will have two kinds of um, I will have so here the unlabeled one is in excess this is an excess so I will have uh, two different combinations at the end the green green the known known will attach to each other with 100 percent complement the green and red will attach to each other there might be some no, imperfect matches and then I will have unhybridized organisms here which have not hybridized with each other for various reasons. Now I can look here what percentage have are same. So these are 100 percent similarity and what percentage are uh, from different genre the known and unknown. If I get up to 97, 98 uh, percent similarity I say they are same species. If it is less than 70 percent similarity I say they are same genus but different species and if this less than 20 percent then I say they are different genre. So depending on how similar they are let us say they have 97 percent similarity so it was nearly perfect hybridization I will say they are same species. 
Now the question is, I have mentioned before, we often use 16 as rRNA similarity to make phylogenetic trees. Now here I am talking about genomic DNA DNA similarity. Now note 16 as rRNA is a very small portion of your um, entire genome. And when I measure entire genome on x axis and uh, 16 as rRNA similarity on y axis, what I can say is that when the remember here what we have talked about, if it is more than 70 percent similarity, they are same species. So, if the genomic DNA has more than 70 percent similarity, which is here top right corner, and that would be that would correspond to more 97 percent similarity in 16 as rRNA similarity. So, in last week's homework, the organisms that had more than 97 percent similarity, we can say they are from same species by on basis of DNA DNA hybridization. Okay. Another way in which we understand what microbes are present is rep PCR. Now, rep PCR is a wonderful technique in which uh, we use the repetitive sequences, palindromic sequences within a gen genomic DNA of a microbe to uh, classify different kinds of microbes. Let us say I have different forms of different strains of pseudomonas in my sample. I know all of them are pseudomonas, but I want to know how many different kinds of pseudomonas I have and what are their relative abundances. So, I can um, design primers that will bind to the repetitive sequences in the pseudomonas and these are the repetitive sequences wherever uh, they are the primers will bind and they will amplify. So, because they are at uh, they are unequally distributed along the genome um, among different microbes, they will make unequal uh, amplicons. And when unequal amplicons are made, I can run them on gel, I can do gel electrophoresis, which is basically separation of nucleic acids on basis of their size. Because the way gel electrophoresis work is that uh, on where we load our samples, which is here on the top, we apply negative charge and DNA being negatively charged molecule is pushed away from it. So, and the speed at which it escapes away from the negative pole is dependent on its size. The smaller particles will run faster, the larger ones will be slow to go. So, the long ones for example, this amplicon would be somewhere here, the shorter ones would be somewhere here. So, depending on the signatures I can say alrighty, uh, the similar ones for example, these three look similar. So, they might be the same pseudomonas. This one this one and this one look similar. So, they might be same pseudomonas. So, I can tell count how many different kinds of microbes I have. So, basically rep PCR will look like this. I take my samples, I isolate DNA, I prepare my PCR reaction for rep PCR, I do my PCR and I done my gel electrophoresis, I get my image, I do analysis of my image and I create my cluster diagram. I see how similar or different the genomes are. The other technique that is used a lot is uh, was used a lot actually nowadays we call it stone age technique at least I call it stone age technique is uh, DGGE. Uh, so, this is a denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis. So, the gel is laid in such a way that it has a gradient of denaturing agent. So, urea or other denaturing agents are put in this gel, but it has a gradient it might have 40 percent to 60 percent. So, here at the bottom there is 60 percent denaturing agent. So, by the time DNA comes here, it will denature more, here it would not. So, as the um, uh, your amplicon travel, they get denatured and according to what their size is and how fast, how much, what the GC content is, they get separated along the uh, one of the axes. Now, uh, the, the samples that have similar fingerprints are likely to have similar microbes and the beauty of DTG is I can actually pick up, for example, look here this band and this band look similar in sense that they have three prominent bands. Now, this one is dominant in this, but this is not very bright in this. So, I can actually pick it up and see what even though these samples look like they have similar composition, but this one is dominant in this condition. So, let us find out what this is. So, I can actually sequence it. And even if I do not sequence it, I can cluster these samples together. So, the similar ones will be clustered together. For example, these two will be nearer to each other than this and this would be. Now, um, this one and this one are very similar, so they are likely to be clustered together, but visually we cannot analyze really well. So, we use software for it and where we identify the bands and we uh, analyze the similarity and create dendrograms. I must say that uh, DGG is quite outdated now, we have better techniques, we just sequence them instead of doing fingerprinting and then we use the sequences to calculate the similarity matrix and then to do hierarchical clustering. Another analysis that has been used a lot is FAME or fatty acid methyl ester analysis, where we basically extract the fatty acid from bacterial culture. 
we derivatize them to form methyl esters and then we do gas chromatography on them, we get the peaks and then on basis of the peaks we tell what how many different kinds of microbes that we have. Now again because this is mostly based on the uh, fatty acids and not necessarily the nucleic acid, this is not as reliable as other DNA based uh, techniques are and definitely not as reliable as next, uh, next generation sequencing technique and thus it is not very popularly used anymore. Alrighty. So, I would like to end this lecture here um, by giving you um, very important information on the taxonomic ranks of microbes. So, we have been using these words very casually until now in all the lectures, but I think it is a very good idea to go through them. So, we have three domains in microbiology, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. So, these are called domain, these are the first broad classification we do. So, remember we have LUCA. The least, the last universal common ancestor, they split into three domains. I have been using the word kingdom also casually, but the technical word is domain. Now, domain are further divided into different phylum, which will be like proteobacteria or acidobacteria or firmicutes. Now, they are further divided into classes like gamma proteobacteria, delta proteobacteria, alpha, beta, epsilon, beta uh, proteobacteria. Okay. Now, even just knowing that okay, this is delta proteobacteria, I can get some information from it. Alrighty, delta, pro delta proteobacteria might have sulfate reducers, for example, because many sulfate reducers are found to be in delta proteobacteria. Or if phylum was Firmicutes and class was Clostridium, I can say, alright, quite possible that cellulose degraders are housed in Clostridia because that is the information we have. Now, we know that this is not necessarily true because some cellulose degraders are not necessarily Clostridium. Anyway, but this is informative. The class is further divided into orders. So, intro, so when this is now I am going towards from broad classification to final classification. So, entero bacterialis, this is the order. From order, if we have more sequence, we can get more uh, information, then we have families like entero bacteriaceae. And then genus Escherichia, and then species such as Escherichia coli or E. coli, which is the uh, model organism for studying bacteria. So, we go from domain to phylum to class to order to family to genus to species and my dear students, I promised you in this class you do not have to memorize by rote, but this taxonomic ranks you do need to uh, memorize by rote. The other important information I want to give you is of this Burgi's manual of systematic bacteriology. There are two manuals of Burgi, one is based on morphology, the other is based on um, genetics. So, this is the volume 2 and it is based on um, genetics. So, what they have done is they have talked about different phylum and classes. In fact, all known phylum classes order family genus and species of my bacteria. So, very, very important manual to have. If possible, try to get a soft copy or a hard copy of this manual and this will be very helpful for you throughout your life. So, Burgi's manual of systematic bacteriology is very important and I encourage you to keep it with you. Um, dear students, this is all for today in this class. In next class, we will go ahead and we will talk about um, more about genomics and now is the time that we will dive straight into the actual environmental problems and how we apply everything you have studied until now to solve them. Also, we will take a brief segue to understand about latest microbiological tools that are used in microbiology, especially in applied environmental microbiology. So, that is all for today. Thank you very much.